Thank you very much, President Oaks and sisters, for that lovely music. This is always a great experience for any of us to have. <clears throat> Often when I'm speaking to student leaders in higher education, I have used the analogy that in a university, the faculty and staff and administration are like the natives and the students are like tourists. In many ways, a recurring devotional speaker is more like one of the natives. Even so, I thank President Oaks for once again extending this precious privilege to me. You may conclude today, however, that I am becoming more like a tourist since today I will try to cover two topics in order to make the most of these fleeting moments. Discipleship includes good citizenship. And in this connection, brothers and sisters, if you are careful students of the statements of the modern prophets, you will have noticed that with rare exceptions, especially when the First Presidency has spoken out, the concerns expressed have been over moral issues, not issues between political parties. The declarations are about principles, not people, and causes, not candidates. On occasions, at other levels in the Church, a few have not been so discreet, so wise, or so inspired. But make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters, in the months and years ahead, events will require of each member that he or she decide whether or not he or she will follow the First Presidency. Members will find it more and more difficult to halt longer between two opinions. President Marion G. Romney said many years ago that he had, quote, never hesitated to follow the counsel of the authorities of the Church even though it crossed my social, professional, or political life, end of quote. This is a hard doctrine, but it is a particularly vital doctrine in a society which is becoming more wicked. In short, brothers and sisters, not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ includes not being ashamed of the prophets of Jesus Christ. We are now entering a period of incredible ironies. Let us cite but one of these ironies, which is yet in its subtle stages. We will see in our time a maximum effort made to establish irreligion as the state religion. It is actually a new form of paganism which uses the carefully preserved and cultivated freedoms of Western civilization to shrink freedom, even as it rejects the value essence of our rich Judeo-Christian heritage. Claire Booth Luce wrote recently, quote, The framers of the Constitution forbade the Congress to make any law respecting the establishment of religion, thus leaving the states free to do so, as several of them did and they explicitly forbade Congress to abridge the free exercise of religion, thus giving actual religious observance a rhetorical emphasis that fully accords <clears throat> with the special concern we know they had for religion. It takes a special ingenuity to wring out of this a governmental indifference to religion, let alone an aggressive secularism. Yet. There are those who insist that the First Amendment actually proscribes governmental partiality not only to any single religion but to religion as such. So the tax exemption for churches is now thought to be unconstitutional. It is startling, she continues, to consider that a clause clearly protecting religion can be construed as requiring that it be denied a status routinely granted to educational and charitable enterprises which have no overt constitutional protection. Far from equalizing unbelief, secularism has succeeded in virtually establishing it. She continues, What the secularists are increasingly demanding in their disingenuous way is that religious people, when they act politically, act only on secularist grounds. They are trying to equate acting on religion with establishing religion. And I repeat, the consequence of such logic is really to establish secularism. It is, in fact, to force the religious to internalize the major premise of secularism, that religion has no proper bearing on public affairs." End of quote. Brothers and sisters, irreligion as the state religion would be the worst of all combinations. Its orthodoxy would be insistent and its inquisitors inevitable. Its paid ministry would be numerous beyond belief its Caesars would be insufferably condescending. Its majorities, when faced with clear alternatives, will make the Barabbas choice, as did a mob centuries ago 
when Pilate confronted them with the need to decide. Your discipleship may see the time come when religious convictions are heavily discounted. Claire Booth Luce also observed, A religious conviction is now a second-class conviction, expected to step deferentially to the back of the secular bus and not to get uppity about it. This new irreligious imperialism seeks to disallow certain people's opinions simply because those opinions grow out of religious convictions. Resistance to abortion will be seen as primitive. Concern over the institution of the family will be viewed as untrendy and unenlightened. In its mildest form, irreligion will merely be condescending towards those who hold to traditional Judeo-Christian values. In its more harsh forms, as is always the case with those whose dogmatism is blinding, the secular Church will do what it can to nullify the opinions of those who still worry over standards such as those in the Ten Commandments. It is always such an easy step from dogmatism to unfair play, especially so when the dogmatists believe themselves to be dealing with primitive people who do not know <clears throat> what is best for them. It is the secular bureaucrat's burden, you see. We will notice, paradoxically, that the new pagans, however, are not so devoted to their beliefs that they are willing to fund their own programs. They prefer to use the funds of believers, but without having to take the latter's opinions. Am I saying that the voting rights of the people of religion are in danger? Of course not. Am I saying it's back to the catacombs? No. But there is occurring a discounting of religiously based opinions. There may even be a covert and subtle disqualification of some for certain offices in some situations. If people, however, are not permitted to advocate, to assert, and to bring to bear in every legitimate way the opinions and views they hold which grow out of their religious convictions, what manner of men and women would we be anyway? Our Founding Fathers did not wish to have a state church established nor to have a particular religion favored by government. They wanted religion to be free to make its own way, but neither did they intend to have irreligion made into a favored state church. Notice the terrible irony if this trend were to continue. When the secular church goes after its heretics, where are the sanctuaries? To what landfalls and Plymouth rocks can future pilgrims go? Without knowing, brothers and sisters, precisely how our Constitution will be most imperiled, I have always assumed personally that the challenges would occur with regard to basic provisions such as the First Amendment and separation of powers, etc., and not in Article 1, Section 9 regarding the conferring of titles of nobilities. What I have just described to you could become one of those basic challenges. If we let come into being a secular church, which is shorn of traditional and divine values, where shall we go for inspiration in the crises of tomorrow? Can we appeal to the rightness of a specific regulation to sustain us in our hours of need? Will we be able to seek shelter under a First Amendment, which by then may have been twisted to favor irreligion? Will we be able to rely for counterforce on value education in school systems which are increasingly secularized? And if our governments and schools were to fail us, would we be able to fall back upon the institution of the family when so many secular movements seek to shred it? It may well be that as our time comes to suffer shame for his name, that some of that special stress will grow out of that portion of discipleship which involves citizenship. Remember, we are, as Nephi and Jacob said, to learn to endure the crosses of the world and yet to despise the shame of it. To go on clinging to the iron rod in spite of the mockery and scorn that flow at us from the multitudes in that great and spacious building seen by Father Lehi, which is the pride of the world, is to disregard the shame of the world. Parenthetically, why, really why, do the disbelievers who line that spacious building watch so intently what the believers are doing? Surely there must be other things for the scorners to do, unless deep within their seeming disinterests there is interest. If the challenge of the secular Church becomes very real, let us, as in all other human relationships, be principled but pleasant. 
Let us be perceptive without being pompous. Let us have integrity and not write checks with our tongues which our conduct cannot cash. Let us be humble and not try to magnify our calling by shrinking the calling of others. Before the ultimate victory of the forces of righteousness, some skirmishes will be lost. Even these, however, must leave a record so that the choices before the people were clear and let others do as they will in the face of prophetic counsel. There will also be times, happily, when a minor defeat seems probable, but others will step forward, having been rallied to rightness by what we do. We will know the joy on occasion of having awakened a slumbering majority of the decent people of all races and creeds, a majority which was till then unconscious of itself. Jesus said that when the fig trees put forth their leaves, summer is nigh. Thus warned that summer is upon us, let us not then complain of the heat. Have I come today, however, only to add one more to the already long list of special challenges faced by you and me? Not really. I have also come to say to you that God, who foresaw all challenges, has given to us a precious doctrine which can encourage us in meeting this and all other challenges. The doctrine of foreordination is one of the doctrinal roads least traveled by, yet it is clearly one in which there is underlined how very long and how perfectly God has loved us and known us with our individual needs and capacities. It is so powerful a doctrine, however, that isolated from other doctrines or mishandled, it can stoke the fires of fatalism, impact adversely upon our agency, cause us to focus on status rather than service, and carry us over into predestination. President Joseph Fielding Smith once warned, quote, It is very evident from a thorough study of the gospel and the plan of salvation that a conclusion that those who accepted the Savior were predestined to be saved, no matter what the nature of their lives must be, are in error. Surely Paul never intended to convey such a thought. Paul, you'll recall, brothers and sisters, stressed running the life race the full distance. He did not intend a casual Christianity in which some had won the race even before the race had started. Yet though foreordination is a difficult doctrine, it has been given to us by the living God through living prophets for a purpose. It can actually increase our understanding of how crucial this mortal estate is, and it can encourage us in further good works. This precious doctrine can also help us to go the second mile because we are doubly called. In some ways, our second estate in relationship to our first estate is like agreeing in advance to surgery. Then the anesthetic of forgetfulness settles in upon us. Just as doctors do not de-anesthetize a patient in the midst of authorized surgery to ask him again if the surgery should be continued, so after divine tutoring, we agreed to come here and to submit ourselves to certain experiences. Of course, when we mortals try to comprehend rather than merely accept foreordination, the result is one in which finite minds futilely try to comprehend omniscience. A full understanding is impossible. We simply have to trust in what the Lord has told us. Knowing enough, however, to realize that we are not dealing with guarantees from God, but extra opportunities and heavier responsibilities. If those responsibilities are in some ways linked to past performance or to past capabilities, it should not surprise us. The Lord has said, There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law on which it is predicated. This is an eternal law, brothers and sisters. It prevailed in the first estate as well as in the second. It should not disconcert us, therefore, that the Lord has indicated that he chose some individuals before they came here to carry out certain assignments, and hence these individuals have been foreordained to those assignments. Foreordination is like any other blessing. It is a conditional bestowal subject to our faithfulness. 
prophecies foreshadow events without determining the outcome because of a divine foreseeing of outcomes. So foreordination is a conditional bestowal of a role, a responsibility, or a blessing which likewise foresees but does not fix the outcome. There have been those who have failed or who have been treasonous to their trust, such as David, Solomon, Judas. God foresaw the fall of David but was not the cause of it. It was David who saw Bathsheba from the balcony and sent for her. But neither was God surprised by such a sad development. God foresaw, but did not cause, Martin Harris's loss of certain pages of the translated Book of Mormon. God made plans to cope with that failure over 1,500 years before it was to occur. Thus, foreordination is clearly no excuse for fatalism or arrogance or the abuse of agency. It is not, however, a doctrine that can simply be ignored because it is difficult. Indeed, deep inside the hardest doctrines are some of the pearls of greatest price. The doctrine pertains not only to the foreordination of the prophets, but to each of us. God, in his precise assessment beforehand as to those who will respond to the words of the Savior and the prophets, is a part of that plan. From the Savior's own lips came these words, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Similarly, the Savior said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And further in this dispensation he declared, And ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. For mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. This responsiveness could not have been gauged without divine foreknowledge concerning all of us mortals and our response one way or another to the gospel. God's foreknowledge is so perfect it leaves the realm of prediction and enters the realm of prophecy. The foreseeing of those who would accept the gospel of mortality gladly and with alacrity is based upon their parallel responsiveness in the pre-mortal world. No wonder the Lord could say as he did to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Paul, when writing to the saints in Rome, said, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Paul also said of God that he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. The Lord, who is able to say to his disciples, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, knew beforehand there was a multitude of fishes there. If he knew beforehand the movements and whereabouts of fishes in the little sea of Tiberias, should it offend us that he knows beforehand which mortals will come into the gospel net? It does no violence even to our frail human logic to observe that there cannot be a grand plan of salvation for all mankind unless there is also a plan for each individual. The salvational sum will reflect all of its parts. Once the believer acknowledges the past, present, and future are before God simultaneously, even though we do not understand how, then the doctrine of foreordination may be seen somewhat more clearly. For instance, it was necessary for God to know how the economic difficulties and crop failures of the Joseph Smith Sr. family in New England would move this special family to Camorra country, where the Book of Mormon plates were buried. God's plans could have scarcely have so unfolded if willy-nilly the Smiths had been born Manchurians and if, meanwhile, the plates had been buried in Belgium. The Lord would need to have perfect comprehension of all the military and political developments, including those now underway in the Middle East, which, when they unfold, will combine to bring to pass a latter-day condition in which all nations will be gathered against Jerusalem to battle. It should not surprise us that the Lord who notices the fall of each sparrow and the hair from every head would know centuries before how much money Judas would receive, 30 pieces of silver, at the time he betrayed the Savior. Quite understandably, the manner in which things unfold seems to us mortals to be so natural. Our not knowing what is to come in the same way that God knows thus preserves our free agency completely. 
when through a process we call inspiration and revelation, we are permitted at times to tap that divine data bank. We are accessing, for the narrow purposes at hand, the knowledge of God. No wonder that experience is so unforgettable. There are clearly special cases of individuals in mortality who have special limitations in life, which conditions we mortals cannot now fully fathom. For all we now know, the seeming limitations may have been an agreed-upon spur to achievement, a thorn in the flesh. Like him who was blind from birth, some come to bring glory to God. We must be exceedingly careful about imputing either wrong causes or wrong rewards to all in such circumstances. They are in the Lord's hands, and He loves them perfectly. Indeed, some of those who have required much waiting upon in this life may be waited upon again by the rest of us in the next world, but for the highest of reasons. Thus, when we are elected to certain mortal shores, we are elected according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. When Abraham was advised that he was chosen before thou wast born and that he was among the noble and great ones, we received a marvelous insight. Through the revelation given to us by the Prophet Joseph F. Smith, we read that the Prophet Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, and other choice spirits were also reserved by God to come forth in the fullness of times to take part in the laying of the foundation of this great Latter-day work. These individuals are among the rulers whom Abraham described, had described to him centuries earlier by God. They were to be rulers in the Church of God, not necessarily rulers in secular kingdoms. Thus, those seen by Abraham were the Spencer W. Kimballs, not the Churchills, the Pauls, not the Caesars. Wise secular leaders do much lasting and commendable good, but as Paul observed to the saints in Corinth, that as the world measured greatness and wisdom, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, In regard to holding the priesthood in the preexistence, I will say that there was an organization there just as well as an organization here, and we there held authority. Men chosen to positions of trust in the spirit world held the priesthood. Alma speaks about foreordination with great effectiveness and links it to the foreknowledge of God and perhaps even to our previous performance. The omniscience of God made it possible, therefore, for Him to determine the boundaries and times of nations. Elder Orson Hyde said of our life in the pre-mortal world, quote, We understood things better there than we do in this lower world. Elder Hyde also surmised as to the agreements we made there as follows. It is not impossible that we sign the articles thereof with our own hands, which articles may be retained in the archives above, to be presented to us when we rise from the dead, and be judged out of our own mouths according to that which is written in the books. Just because we have forgotten, said Elder Hyde, our forgetfulness cannot alter the facts. Brothers and sisters, the degree of detail involved in the covenants and promises we participated in at that time may be a much more highly customized thing than many of us here surmise. Yet on one occasion, even with our forgetting, there may be inklings. President Joseph F. Smith wrote, But in coming here we forgot all, that our agency might be free indeed, to choose good or evil, that we might merit the reward of our choices and conduct. But by the power of the Spirit and the redemption of Christ, through obedience we often catch a spark from the awakened memories of the immortal soul, which lights up our whole being as with the glory of our former home. As indicated earlier, this powerful teaching of foreordination is bound to be a puzzlement in some respects, especially if we do not have faith and trust in the Lord. Yet if we think about it, even within our finite framework of experience, it shouldn't startle us. Mortal parents are reasonably good at predicting the behavior of their children in certain circumstances. Of this, Elder James E. Talmage wrote, Our Heavenly Father has a full knowledge of the nature and disposition of each of His children. 
a knowledge gained by long observation and experience in the past eternity of our primeval childhood, a knowledge compared with which that gained by earthly parents through mortal experience with their children is infinitesimally small. By reason of that surpassing knowledge, God reads the future of each child, of men individually and collectively, of communities and nations. He knows what each will do under given conditions and sees the end from the beginning. His foreknowledge is based on intelligence and reason. He foresees the future as a state which naturally and surely will be, not as one which must be because he has arbitrarily willed that it shall be. Another helpful analogy for students is the reality that universities, including this one, can and do predict with a high degree of accuracy the grades entering students will receive in their college careers based upon certain tests, past performances, and so forth. If mortals can do this with reasonable accuracy and even with a short span of familiarity and finite data, God the Father, who knows us perfectly, surely can foresee how we will respond to various challenges. While we often do not rise to our opportunities, God is neither pleased nor surprised. But we cannot say to him later on that we could have achieved if we had just been given the chance. This is all part of the justice of God. One of the most helpful, indeed very necessary, parallel truths to be pondered when studying this powerful doctrine of foreordination is given in the revelation of the Lord to Moses in which the Lord says, And all things are present with me, for I know them all. God does not live in the dimension of time, as do we. Moreover, since all things are present with God, His is not simply a predicting based solely upon the past. In ways which are not clear to us, He actually sees rather than foresees the future, because all things are at once present before Him. In a revelation given to the Prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord described himself as the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. From the Prophet Nephi we receive the same basic insight in which we likewise must trust. But the Lord knoweth all things from the beginning, wherefore he prepareth a way to accomplish all his works among the children of men. One of the dimensions of worshiping a living God is to know that he is alive and living in the sense of foreseeing. He is not a retired God whose best years are past, to whom we should pay a retroactive obeisance, worshiping him for what he has already done. He is the living God who is at once in the dimensions of the time containing the past and the present and the future, while we labor constrained by the limitations of time itself. It is imperative, brothers and sisters, that we always keep in mind the caveats noted earlier, so that we do not indulge ourselves or our whims simply because of the presence of this powerful doctrine of foreordination. For with special opportunities come special responsibilities and much greater risks. But the doctrine of foreordination, properly understood and humbly pursued, can help us immensely in coping with the vicissitudes of life. Otherwise, time can tug at us and play so many tricks upon us. We should always understand that while God is never surprised, we often are. Life episodes can take on a new meaning. For instance, Simon the Cyrenian wandered into Jerusalem that very day and was pressed into service by Roman soldiers to help carry the cross of Christ. Simon's son, Rufus, joined the Church and was so well thought of by the Apostle Paul that the latter mentioned Rufus in his epistle to the Romans, describing him as chosen in the Lord. Was it therefore a mere accident that Simon, who passed by coming out of the country, was asked to bear the cross of Jesus? Properly humbled and instructed concerning the great privileges that are ours, we can cope with what seem to be very dark days and difficult developments because we will have a true perspective about things as they really are, and we can see in them a great chance to contribute. Churchill, in trying to rally his countrymen in an address at Harrow School in October of 1941, said to them, Do not let us speak of darker days. 
Let us rather speak of sterner days. These are not dark days. These are great days, the greatest days our country has ever lived. And we must all thank God that we have been alive, each of us according to our stations, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Brothers and sisters, so we should regard the dispensation of the fullness of times. Even when we face stern challenges and circumstances, these are great days. Our hearts need not fail us. We can be equal to our challenges, including the aforementioned challenge of the secular Church. The truth about forward nation also helps us to taste the deep wisdom of Alma when he said we ought to be content with the things that God hath allotted to each of us. If indeed the things allotted to each of us have been divinely customized according to our ability and capacity, then for us to seek to wrench ourselves free of our schooling circumstances could be to tear ourselves away from carefully matched opportunities. To rant and to rail could be to go against divine wisdom, wisdom in which we may have once concurred before we came here. God knew beforehand each of our coefficients for coping and contributing and has so ordered our lives. The late President Henry de Moyle said, I believe that we as fellow workers in the priesthood might well take to heart the admonition of Alma and be content with what God hath allotted to us. We might well be assured that we had something to do with our allotment in our pre-existent state. This would be an additional reason for us to accept our present condition and make the best of it. It is what we agreed to do. By the way, brothers and sisters, I hasten to add that among the things allotted are not things like a bad temper. The deficiencies of a developmental variety are those we are expected to overcome. Now, as I prepare to conclude, what a vastly different view of life the doctrine of forward nation gives to us. Shorn of this perspective, others are puzzled or bitter about life. Someone once said, that to them life was like trying to play a game of billiards on a table with a rumple cloth with a crooked cue and an elliptical billiard ball. <laughs> Perhaps the moral of that analogy is that we should stay out of pool halls. <laughs> In any event, pessimism does not really reckon with life and the universe as these things really are. The disciple will be puzzled at times, too, but he persists. Later he rejoices over how wonderfully things fit together, realizing only then that with God things never were apart. Jacob said, The Spirit teaches us the truth of things as they really are and really will become. Centuries later, Paul said, The Spirit searcheth the deep things of God. Of some of these deep things we have spoken today and of how things really are. Brothers and sisters, in some of those precious and personal moments of deep discovery, there will be a sudden surge of recognition, of an immortal insight, a doctrinal déjà vu. We will sometimes experience a flash from the mirror of memory that beckons us forward toward a far horizon. When in situations of stress, we wonder if there is any more in us to give. We can be comforted to know that God, who knows our capacity perfectly, placed us here to succeed. No one was foreordained to fail or to be wicked. When we have been weighed and found wanting, let us remember that we were measured before and we were found equal to our tasks, and therefore let us continue but with a more determined discipleship. When we feel overwhelmed, let us recall the assurance that God will not overprogram us. He will not press upon us more than we can bear. The doctrine of foreordination is not a doctrine of repose. It is a doctrine for the second milers. It will draw out of them the last full measure of devotion. It is a doctrine of perspiration not aspiration. Moreover, it discourages aspiring, lest we covet, like two early disciples, 
that which has already been given to another. Foreordination is a doctrine for the deep believer and will only bring a scorn from the skeptic. When, as Joseph F. Smith said, we catch a spark from the awakened memories of the immortal soul, let us be quietly grateful. And when of great truths we can come to say, I know, that powerful spiritual witness may also carry with it the sense of our having known before. With rediscovery, what we are really saying is, I know, again. God bless you and keep you, my special friends, to the end that you will each carry out all of the assignments given to you so very long ago. You have been measured and found adequate for the challenges that will face the kingdom of God, of that you should have a deep inner assurance. Be true to that trust, as all of us must, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.